On behalf of the Alumni Relations Office here at Dartmouth, welcome to the third Back to Class Faculty Talk of 2013. My name is Robin Albing, and I'm the Director of Continuing Education and Travel here at Dartmouth. Our office creates learning opportunities for our, our alumni, their friends, and their families all around the world through our alumni travel program. We also do programs here on campus, like today's faculty lecture, and also things during reunions and homecoming. In addition to that, we also do things across the country called Dartmouth on Location. And if you would like to read more about our programs, please check out the Alumni Relations website, and you'll see a list of all the events that we do. And if you didn't pick up any of those travel brochures that are out on the table, please take those as well. We'd love to see you on some of our trips. We hope you also had a chance to register today because not only will you get on our mailing list for back to class, but you also will register to win a camera case that we have out there. Today we also have um, a 10% off coupon for Belocos if you wanted to have lunch there today. Before our program begins, we'd ask you to please turn off or silence your cell phones. Our schedule this morning includes a presentation by Dean Marion, followed by time for you to ask some questions. So without further delay, Nancy Marion is the Associate Dean for the Social Sciences and the George J. Records 1956 Professor of Economics here at Dartmouth College, where she teaches courses in international finance and open economy macroeconomics. Her research is focused on macroeconomic and international finance issues. She has also been a visiting scholar at the International Monetary Fund and a frequent lecturer at the IMF Institute on a range of topics related to financial crises in emerging markets. Nancy received her BA from Oberlin College, a Master's of Public Policy from the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University, and a PhD in Economics from Princeton. Please help me welcome Dean Nancy Marion. It's great to be here. Um, I was just thinking if Congress had not voted to raise the debt ceiling on Wednesday night, I would have had to switch my topic to US debt default, what lies ahead. But since Congress did, in fact, raise the debt ceiling, at least for a few months, I can stick with the topic that I originally chose, which is the European crisis and why it's so difficult to resolve. I'm actually amazed that anyone is here, because I'm thinking to myself, this is a Saturday morning. It's a time to kick back and have that second cup of coffee and read the newspaper or it's a chance on such a beautiful day to walk around the green and see the beautiful fall colors. And yet, here you are in Alumni Hall with no windows at 10 a.m. on a Saturday morning, ready to engage with another pretty heavyweight economic topic, namely the Eurozone crisis. Before I get started, I'd just like to learn a little bit about this group. And so can I have a show of hands how many of you ever studied economics when you were in college? Great, okay. Next question. How many of you ever used economic analysis or finance in your professional life? Okay. My last question. How many of you have ever traveled within the last five years to a country that uses the euro as its currency. Okay. So that gives me a little bit of insight into this group. My plan is to talk for maybe 30 to 40 minutes about the eurozone crisis and then open it up to questions. This is um, advertised as an hour session, so I'm going to be very cognizant of the time and try to end it right about 11 o'clock, since we all have other things that we might want to be doing as well. I'm going to start by backing up a bit. I'm going to argue that in order to understand why the Eurozone crisis is so difficult to, am I okay on, okay, 
I was just, you looked al alarmed, okay. All right, why the Eurozone crisis is so difficult to resolve. We have to back up a bit and first address two other important questions. First, we need to ask ourselves, why did some European countries decide to get together and form a Eurozone in the first place? In other words, why did some countries decide to give up their national currencies, German Deutsche Marks, French francs, Italian lira, for example, and instead adopt a single currency, the euro, back in 1999? Okay. The second question we have to ask ourselves is, what is this crisis all about? What is the nature of the financial crisis in Europe? And once we've addressed those two issues, then, and only then, can I think we turn our attention to the third question, which is, why is this crisis so hard to resolve? We've seen over the last few years that European leaders have gotten together on numerous occasions, often on an emergency basis. They've issued communiques, often on a weekend. They have adopted various policy actions, and yet the crisis in Europe is still severe, and there's still a lot to be done. Why is that? Okay. So let's go and start with the first question. Why a Eurozone? Okay. Back in 1999, 11 countries, including some big ones, Germany, France, Italy, decided to form a Eurozone and adopt a common currency. After those 11 countries formed the Eurozone, in later years, other countries also joined the Eurozone. Greece, for example, joined in 2001, and then we've had some additional members join, Slovakia, Estonia, Cyprus, et cetera, in more recent years. And so now there are 17 European countries that are part of this Eurozone. So why give up national currencies in order to adopt a single currency. Several reasons I want to put forward. One is pretty obvious, but probably not all that important. And that is, it reduces transactions costs. If you are an importer in Italy, and you're importing a good from Spain, in the olden days, you'd have to convert your Italian lira into Spanish pesetas, in order to purchase that imported Spanish good. And every time you exchange one currency for another, it involves a small transactions fee. So it's just a lot easier when you're buying goods among countries that trade a lot with each other if you can use a single currency and not have to deal with those transactions costs. That's one thing. There is a more important reason why having a Eurozone was very attractive for these countries. And that was to reduce exchange rate uncertainty. If you have a bunch of countries, and each country has its own independent currency, and the value of that currency is determined in the markets by forces of supply and demand, then it's certainly possible that those currency values can move around quite a bit. And that can create uncertainty for exporters, for importers, and for investors. Well, you say, instead of having market-determined or flexible exchange rates that can create so much uncertainty, why not move to a system of fixed exchange rates? And the European countries did, in fact, do that, where each government fixed the value of its national currency. But when you fix the exchange rate, that doesn't eliminate exchange rate uncertainty. Why is that? Because over time, economic events and conditions change, and at some point it may be that a government will have to change the value of its fixed exchange rate. Or, more commonly, governments are very reluctant to change those fixed exchange rate values, but intense speculative forces in international capital markets may force governments to dismantle their fixed exchange rates. That happened in Europe about 20 years ago. And remember George Soros? 
He earned about a billion dollars with a B, betting against the Bank of England that England would not be able to keep its exchange rate fixed within this European system of fixed exchange rates. And a lot of the European countries gave up their fixed exchange rate at that time. So the Europeans thought if we don't want flexible exchange rates and all the volatility and uncertainty that may create, and fixed exchange rates don't seem to be a very viable system in a world of high capital mobility and potential speculative attacks, then we need to do something else to promote exchange rate certainty. Let's have a single currency. And so they started having discussions to adopt this single currency. And the idea was if you could reduce exchange rate risk or eliminate it, then that would promote greater trade among these countries, and greater trade would also promote economic prosperity in these countries. So those were two really important reasons to adopt a single currency. There was also the political motivation. The thought was if you had greater economic integration, that would lead in time to greater political integration. Well, so far I've just talked about some positive benefits of having a single currency. Are there any downsides to adopting a single currency? There's one huge economic downside. When you have a single currency, you give up a very important policy tool. You no longer have your own independent central bank that can adopt its own or run its own independent monetary policy. Why is this potentially problematic? Suppose you're a country and you face a bad economic shock, say a sudden drop in aggregate demand for your products, and it's mostly pronounced on your economy and not other economies in the region. If you had an independent monetary policy, you might be able to have your central bank lower the domestic interest rate at home, and that lower interest rate would encourage more borrowing and more spending. But if you don't have your own central bank and independent monetary policy, you cannot use that interest rate tool to cushion your economy from a potentially bad shock. And this is very problematic in Europe if you don't have other policy tools available or other mechanisms available that can help cushion your economy in the face of shocks. So if fiscal policy, government spending, and tax policies are slow to change, and if you don't have a good fiscal transfer mechanism from the center to areas that are hit by bad shocks, and if you don't have high labor mobility that could also cushion shocks, you are basically going forward with one hand tied behind your back. You don't have this important policy tool. Okay, so obviously forming a European Eurozone involves a calculus of costs and benefits. And I've just enumerated a few economic benefits as well as costs of joining a Eurozone. And I've also talked about some of the political benefits of having a Eurozone. And I would argue that Europeans grappled with both the economic and the political costs and benefits in deciding to form the Eurozone. And the political benefits dominated. The economic arguments were never that persuasive, but the political arguments were. And why is that? I think my next slide tells the story. It highlights Germany. Okay, so how does Germany play an important role in the thinking about the Eurozone? Well, we can go all the way back to early discussions in Europe in the late 40s and the early 1950s. In 1957, after years of conversation, six European countries, including West Germany, came together and formed the European Common Market. And yes, there were good economic arguments for doing so, because within a common market, you're going to dismantle tariff barriers on each other's goods and services, and that should promote greater 
European trade and prosperity. But in addition, there were strong political reasons for joining together in a European common market. And before that, back in 1952, joining together in a common market for coal and steel, two war materials. And that was to prevent Germany from being a political or military threat to its neighbors and never having another major war in Europe. So the idea was if these countries could come together in a common market, then economies, this institution would so cement economies together in some interdependent maze that no single country could undertake independent aggressive actions against its neighbors. So there was a really important political reason for this inter needed interdependence of economies. In addition, of course, the thought was as economic integration and prosperity flourished, then Europe could regain its rightful place after World War II as a center of power and dignity. Okay? So there are really strong arguments for the formation of the European coal and steel community in the early 50s, the European common market, later the European Union, and finally the Eurozone. All right, so even though I'm going to argue that the political arguments really dominated the economic arguments for the creation of the Eurozone, even so, over the first nine years of the Eurozone, from 1999 up through about 2007 or 8, the Eurozone thrived. Financial markets were uh, quiet, tranquil, and the economies in the Eurozone did in fact prosper. Everyone thought, wow, maybe some of those economic costs that were in the calculus before weren't so important. But then, of course, in, 19, sorry, 19, in 2007, problems started to emerge, both in the United States and in Europe. In the United States, home prices had been falling, and assets tied to mortgages became questionable in value. Banks, both in the United States and in Europe, faced mounting losses. And because of uncertainty in bank balance sheets, banks found it increasingly difficult to borrow, and the interbank market essentially collapsed. Now, a number of Europeans said they were innocent victims of the US problems. But actually, the European banks were in the thick of things. They were very eager to buy up dodgy American securities that were backed by these mortgages. And they often bought up these securities by borrowing funds from the American money, market, money markets. So we have problems both with the US banks and the European banks. Then Greece moves to center stage. A new government is elected in Greece in the fall of 2009. They start looking through the books. And in 2010, they announce to the world that, you know, the fiscal situation in Greece is actually worse than what's previously reported. Instead of the government budget deficit being an enormous 6% of GDP, that budget deficit is more on the order of 12% of GDP. This was just a huge figure, and it rattled the international markets. And Greece then saw in the international markets that it was increasingly difficult for it to borrow. Interest rates uh, rose dramatically because people wanted to be compensated for the risk of holding Greek government debt. Eventually, interest rates were so high for Greece that they were really unable to borrow in the international markets, or borrowing at that rate would really sort of make it less likely that they could repay. And so finally, Greece asked for a bailout. A bailout was forthcoming in the spring of 2010 and late 2010. And um, in return for that bailout, Greece promised 
to undertake austerity measures. Well, when Greece ran into problems, then everyone started focusing like a laser beam on the public finances of other European countries within the Eurozone, particularly the southern periphery, such as Spain or Italy, not to mention Portugal and Ireland, found very troubling information about the public finances of these countries, and suddenly Europe found itself faced with a full-blown financial crisis. So, what is the nature of this financial crisis? If I had to ask you to just come up with pictures that could illustrate the nature of the financial crisis, no words, just pictures, what kind of pictures would you put on the slides? I've given you an example of one that illustrates partly that financial crisis, namely huge demonstrations in downtown Athens against the austerity program the cutbacks in government spending, the proposed increases in taxes, although Greece has made an art of avoiding paying taxes. Right? But what other pictures would come to mind if you wanted to just illustrate the financial crisis? Anyone? What would you, what would you put? What would you select? Any ideas? Huh? Yes. All right, okay. Anything else? Yes. Foreclosure signs on property in Spain. Good, that's right. Housing bus, real estate, property bus. Anything else that comes to mind? Just in terms of pictures. Uh, David Cameron, uh, Prime Minister. Good. Yes, okay. Okay, good. Good, particularly youth, un youth unemployment problems in other areas, good. So these are all part of what this financial crisis is. I just selected a few pictures, but I think I'm capturing some of the things, not the North African uh, agricultural products, not the ports, but I am capturing, I think, some of the things of, about this financial crisis. So demonstrations against proposed austerity. Here, your property bust, houses that um, go empty because of overbuilding. Unemployment lines all over, but here are unemployment lines in Spain. Lines outside banks. This is outside a uh, bank in Cyprus, so bank runs, bank difficulties. Here's the Prime Minister of Portugal announcing a bailout for Portugal. So clearly sovereigns, sovereign states in distress. Okay? And we could go on, a number of things. So what I wanted to add, bring us to the second question that I said was needed as background for understanding why the crisis is so hard to resolve, I want to talk a little bit about the nature of this financial crisis. And what I'm going to say here is that the crisis is a very difficult crisis because it really is three crises wrapped into one. There is a banking crisis going on in Europe. There is a sovereign debt crisis going on in Europe. And there is a growth crisis or a lack of growth and employment opportunities going on in Europe. And each one of these plays into the overall crisis. So let's just look briefly at what I mean by a banking crisis, a sovereign debt crisis, and a growth crisis. Okay? So here's a bank crisis. When we teach our students about banking crises, we start with a classic bank run. We say a bank takes your deposits, keeps a little bit on reserve, and loans out the rest. But if people come to doubt the quality of that bank, even sometimes if there's deposit insurance and you're worried it's going to take a while to get fully covered, 
you may want to get to the bank and have your um, deposit withdrawn for cash. So a bank run occurs when you're fearful that the bank is going to break its promise. It's not going to be able to convert your deposit back into cash one for one. Okay? That is a classic bank run. And you avoid that by having confidence in the banks and also a good deposit insurance scheme. Okay? We have seen some classic bank runs in Europe. Cyprus was certainly a case. There were some bank runs in Greece, of course. Okay? We'll forget about England, because England's not in the Eurozone, but the UK had some bank runs as well, Northern Rock. That's a classic bank crisis. But the banking problems also are, are broader than that. What you have in Europe are a lot of weak banks. They have weak balance sheets. They hold a lot of sovereign debt that's questionable in value and questionable in quality. Those European banks are undercapitalized. And no one is quite sure of what future losses for those banks will be. That's very problematic in Europe because in Europe, the banking sector is a huge chunk of the overall financial sector. And in Europe, European firms rely much more on bank finance for their operations than do firms in other countries. So if you don't have a healthy banking system, you have weak balance sheets, you have banks unwilling to lend to the private sector, that's going to lead to an unhealthy economy. And Europe has not done the stringent stress tests on their banks that the United States did on its banks. So you have this lingering bank crisis that is in turn putting a drag on the economy. And the poster child for what happens if you don't clean up your banks is Japan that's been struggling with this for the last 20 years. Okay? So that's part of what's going on is a banking crisis in Europe. But that's certainly not the only thing. In addition, there is a sovereign debt crisis. Now again, the classic example of a sovereign debt crisis, thank heavens it wasn't the United States on Thursday morning, but that is a country that says we are either unwilling or unable to pay back in full on time. So if I borrow a dollar from you and I'm a country and I owe you a dollar ten at some point down the road and that time comes and I can't pay you back the full dollar ten, I can only pay you back 80 cents, or I can pay you the dollar ten but I say not today, can we wait six more months? Either of those things would be a default. Okay? That's a classic sovereign debt crisis when the government can't pay in full on time. And we've certainly seen that among some of the Eurozone countries where Greece could not, in fact, pay its debts on time or in full. And of course, a lot of Greek creditors have taken a haircut where debts have just been forgiven and they're never going to see full repayment on the loans that they have made to the Greek government. It was done in some kind of negotiated way rather than abruptly as what happened in Argentina when they defaulted on their debt in 2001. But nevertheless, that is a classic sovereign debt crisis. But again, in Europe, it's broader than that. Any time that countries have difficulty borrowing in the international capital markets, that is a stress on sovereigns, and that contributes to this sovereign debt crisis. So what you saw in Europe were interest rates on Greek debt, on Italian debt, on Spanish debt, or in Portuguese debt. Those interest rates rose way above the relatively free interest rate on German debt. Why is that? Because the markets lacked confidence in those countries' public finances. And demanding a higher interest rate is really compensating you for the risk of holding those riskier sovereign debt instruments. So that's sort of the true nature of the European sovereign debt crisis. Some that really can't repay, and they're talking about Greece having another set of downgrades on its debt in the future but many other countries paying higher interest rates to a more skeptical uh, set of international creditors. What's the third part of the European 
or Eurozone financial crisis. It's a growth crisis. In Europe as a whole, for 2013, it's expected that Europe will contract by about one half a percent of its GDP. In addition, European wide unemployment is much too high. It's about 12 percent. But this growth crisis is uneven within the Eurozone. So in Germany, for instance, the best forecast by the IMF is that German growth will be anemic but positive in 2013. So Germany should grow at about a half a percent of GDP this year. And its unemployment rate nationally is about 7 percent. But Greece is expected to contract again this year on top of previous major contractions. It's expected to contract this year on the order of 4.5 percent. It's huge, just huge. And its unemployment rate is 27 percent, with youth un unemployment even higher. Italy is expected to contract about 2 percent this year. Spain, about 2 percent. Italy's national unemployment rate is 12 percent. Spain's is 26 percent. And again, with youth unemployment, about 50 percent. So there's a very uneven impact here, but they have a very serious growth deficit and unemployment is much too high. So these are the three things that are all part of the European financial crisis. They have banking distress, they have sovereign debt distress, and this third component, they lack growth and good employment opportunities. The other issue is all three of these crises are all interconnected, and that makes it much more complicated. Let me just give you an example. If you have low growth, and hence asset prices are falling, that can feed into your banks, giving them weaker balance sheets and hurting your banks. Or you can have the arrow going from banking crisis to growth. If banks are weak and have very um, poor balance sheets or they're undercapitalized and they need to raise capital, they may do it by trying to cut back on lending to the private sector. And with less lending to the private sector, particularly in Europe where bank lending is so important, that can act as a drag on growth. Or look at the arrows going back and forth between the sovereign debt crisis and the banking crisis. Banks in Europe hold a lot of sovereign debt. Greek banks hold a lot of Greek government debt. So if a sovereign defaults or can't repay, that immediately hurts the balance sheets of the banks and might even cause a systemic bank collapse. On the other hand, if the banks are weak and require support from the government, that really hurts governments that are already trying to deal with fiscal austerity and have already done their best to try to support the banks. Look at Ireland, for example, where Ireland took on the liabilities of its banks only to find that those liabilities exceeded the whole value of its GDP. So bank distress immediately caused huge sovereign distress. And then finally, look at the linkages between sovereign debt crises and growth crises. If I want to make the markets more confident in my sovereign debt, and I want to get those interest rates down at which I borrow, one way to produce more confidence is to issue less debt. And that means I've got to cut my government budget deficit. So that means I have to cut government spending, or I have to raise taxes, or do some combination. But when the government contracts, that reduces demand in the economy, and that can hurt growth. Now, when the Europeans first started on austerity, there was a theory running around that said, you know, when the government contracts, that will so enhance confidence that the government is getting its fiscal house in order that confidence will spur more private spending, and we won't have a huge cut in our growth. Turns out. That didn't happen. Even the IMF has 
issued some mea culpa reports. They bought into some of that theory. And they said, you know, the cutbacks in government have had a much more severe impact on economies in Europe than we had originally forecast. Also, the arrow goes the other way. If we have low or negative growth in a country, as incomes fall, tax revenues that are linked to income automatically decline. That increases the government's budget deficit and forces them to issue even more debt. So everything is all interconnected, and you can't look at things just discreetly. All right, I'm running out of time, and so I need to get to the question that was really the uh, title, or the advertised title of this talk, which is, why is the Eurozone crisis so difficult to resolve? We could come up with a number of reasons. I'm going to focus on just two in the time I have remaining. Okay? Here are our leaders, or past leaders, trying to, at one of the meetings to resolve this Eurozone crisis. The first thing I'm going to point out is directly related to what I just said about the three crises being interconnected, the banking crisis, the sovereign debt crisis, and the growth crisis. And the first thing I'm going to argue is, so far, policy actions have been adopted that pretty much deal with one crisis at a time. And when you deal with just one crisis, it can actually make another one of the crises even worse. Now, if you've been following what I said about the interconnectivity of these crises, you can figure out what I'm talking about here. So suppose you're trying to deal with the sovereign debt crisis. You want governments to issue less government debt, so that will increase confidence in the markets, and hence government borrowing costs in those international capital markets will decline. So you tell governments you have to adopt austerity. You have to get your fiscal houses in order. You have to cut government spending, raise taxes, or do both in order that you have a smaller government deficit and you're issuing less debt. Okay? So you go to austerity and you focus on um, reducing the sovereign debt crisis, but you've just made the growth crisis worse because you've taken demand out of the economy. Classic example is Greece. Back in 2010, its debt to GDP ratio was about 113%. Last year, because its GDP, that's the bottom of that ratio, had declined so much that its debt GDP ratio was 170%. So going for austerity, and we can argue about how much the Greeks really did do austerity, but going for austerity actually made their debt to GDP ratio much higher. Now it's coming down this year, but only because of debt forgiveness. All right? So that's one problem. A policy that addresses one of the crises can hurt another. Another is, an example is banking. Europe is about to do more rigorous stress tests on their banks. And one of the things that's going to come out of these stress tests is a requirement that banks hold more capital to strengthen their balance sheets. And one important way that banks are going to try to do this is by lending less. And so again, dealing with the banking problems is going to have some spillover and a bad spillover effect, in the short term at least, on the growth crisis. Okay? So that's one reason why this financial crisis is so difficult to resolve because there are really three crises and you really need policies that would address all three. I'm going to end with what I think is an even more important problem and that is this political question of who is going to bear the cost of resolving the financial crisis in Europe in a more global sense. And let me give you an example. One thing that a lot of economists and policymakers have been talking about as a more macro solution to resolving the European or Eurozone crisis has been to adopt a banking union, very much like our Federal Reserve System here in the United States. Okay? And what is a banking union? It essentially has three components. 
You have one single supervisor that regulates and supervises all the banks in the system. You have one resolution authority, and that authority then could decide to either inject emergency funds into a weak bank or to shut down a bad bank or to restructure that bank. And the third component of a banking union is a Eurozone-wide deposit insurance scheme so that depositors feel that their deposits within the banks are safe. Well, let's look at how Europe is doing on addressing this policy proposal of a banking union. First, supervision. Even the negotiations about having a single supervisory authority have been very difficult. To date, supervision and regulation of the banks in Europe have been the responsibilities of individual central banks in Europe that don't have any authority to do monetary policy, but still have authority to regulate and supervise the banks. And those national governments are very reluctant to give up those regulatory and supervisory roles to a single authority. Well, it turns out just this week, European finance ministers did come to some agreement to have a single supervisory authority. It's going to be the European Central Bank, and it's going to be enacted in November of 2014. And even though the European Central Bank will now be responsible in a year from now for all 6,000 banks in Europe, de facto, it's really going to be supervising the big banks in Europe those with assets greater than 30 billion euros. And it's going to delegate to the national authorities supervision and regulation of many of the other banks. That's just one part of the banking union. The trickiest and the hardest one is banking resolution. Who's responsible for either injecting new money into weak banks, restructuring those banks, or shutting them down and paying off the creditors? The banks in Spain, Italy, and Greece say, we're weak. We have weak balance sheets. We don't know what our future losses are going to be. Our governments are weak. Our governments can't step up to the plate and provide this kind of support to the banks. But the Germans say, just wait a minute. <laughs> we don't want our taxpayers being responsible for the losses in banks in other countries. We think each country should be responsible for banking losses within their own country. And Angela Merkel has said, if we want to change that policy and have a single resolution authority as part of this banking union, we should require each country to vote on that, have some kind of referendum, change the treaties. And we know that's kicking the can down the road for a number of years. Well, the German voters support Angela Merkel's approach here. Over half of German voters polled during the recent national elections in Germany felt that they had written enough checks for the rest of the Eurozone countries. More than half the voters in Germany said for Germany to give any more aid to its other hurting Eurozone member countries, that should require a voter referendum before that happens. About two-thirds of voters in Germany have said there should not be any more aid given without a referendum. 57% of German voters say there should be no more debt forgiveness for any of the other Eurozone members. And 55% of Germans polled said they should just let some of the more difficult Eurozone members leave the Eurozone. So as you can see here, each country is trying to minimize its share of the burden of resolving some of these banking, sovereign debt, and growth problems within the entire Eurozone. Well, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know how this is going to play out over the next several years. But here's my best guess. The Europeans will muddle through, going very, very slowly, debating among themselves who is actually going to bear the burden and the costs 
of some more substantial holistic resolution to the crisis. And muddling along might work unless there is another major big shock to the system, say a US debt default in February or some other shock, which then could bring the whole house of cards tumbling down. So on that optimistic note, I'm going to stop here and see what kinds of questions you might have about the Eurozone crisis. Yes? Um, you have done a very good job of presenting a hopeless situation, but you haven't offered your own correct opinions. What would you do if you could? Well, it's difficult. I mean, I, had, I actually joked with one member of the audience before this talk that my main goal here was to provide you with some background and some understanding of how difficult this crisis is, but not leave you with any clear-cut solutions, which is one reason we haven't seen any one country or group of countries adopt a clear solution. I'd say most policymakers and economists have said there need to be two things a banking union, and greater fiscal integration. Both of those are very difficult to bring about. Now, in terms of the banking union, you could even look at the United States history as an example of how difficult it was. When we formed our US Constitution, we did have a national bank. But then when Andrew Jackson was elected, he was elected on a platform of ending that national bank in 1834, and we had no Federal Reserve System until 1913. And that only came about because of the severe financial crisis we faced in 1905. So almost 100 years of debate before we saw the importance of having a Federal Reserve System that's now 100 years in place. So it's not surprising that it's taking the Europeans a long time and will take them a long time to put in place all the pieces of a banking union. And some have said that just putting in place a partial banking union may be worse than not having any banking union at all. So we have that part, and I'd say that the other piece has got to be greater fiscal integration. So for instance, when Nevada has a bad shock, a property bust, high unemployment, People leave Nevada and they go other places where there are jobs. In Europe, you don't have that sense of labor mobility where people leave the high unemployment areas and move to somewhere where there are greater opportunities. Although, as Michael pointed out, Cameron is putting out the ads to get people to do this kind of movement. The US also has a greater fiscal transfer system. So when California goes bust, Fewer tax revenues, because incomes fall, fewer tax revenues go to the center, to the federal government. And the federal government is supplying automatically more transfers back to California. And, and so that helps cushion what's going on in a particular state. The Europeans don't have that, but you can see how politically difficult that would be to have those fiscal transfers going from the center, where Germany would be a big contributor towards the periphery where you have demand being in a real slump. So the political obstacles are so huge, even though we can say a greater fiscal transfer union and a, greater, and a banking union would be two pieces of that solution, I think the political barriers are quite difficult. That said then, maybe the answer is a Eurozone that is leaner and meaner, has Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, a smaller set of countries that really could have a single currency because their policies and their economies are in sync and let the others go. Merkel has said, we want to preserve the Eurozone. But as the American ambassador to Germany said on this campus just a few days ago, not at any price. Okay. So I haven't answered your question, but I gave some comments. <laughs> You spent a lot of time talking about the quote evil banks. You put them at the top of I never pyramid. used that word. <laughs> you put them at the top of your pyramid. Yes. But one of the things you didn't talk about is where did the sovereign debt come from? The sovereign debt came because there was less money coming in that was being that was being spent. But the company countries that had low credit ratings, the priests, okay, they were able to borrow euros sharing the credit rating of the Eurozone. 
That's right. So it is it and at the continuing time, and where did who did they sell this debt to? They sold it to the to the banks. That's one. Number two, if you take your Euro map and you superimpose a map of the United States on there, you could come up with our groups, California, Nevada, Detroit, these kind of, Illinois, and you could come up with that, and you could superimpose our Germany, which is the Midwest. But what we've got here, fortunately, is we've already got control and we can deeply regulate our banks, which Germany cannot do. And the other thing, we can deeply have the ability to go after the rich people, or go after the Middle East, or go after, not the Middle East, the Midwest, or go after Germany, so that they continue to pay for the increase in our sovereign debt. And it's that's just, right. we're not, we're, we're right there, the same place. That's right, but so that's right. And we still have these serious pockets of differences within the United States, but you're right, it's been cushioned somewhat over what it would have been had we not had that integrated banking system and the fiscal transfers. And you're right in terms of how the banks got in trouble when many of these European countries joined the Eurozone, particularly in the southern periphery, it was suddenly a good housekeeping seal of approval. They, it was perceived by the markets that these were low risk areas to lend to. And so there was a huge amount of international capital movements going from Northern Europe into Southern Europe. And you get the same kind of debates that you get in the United States about all the lending to um, subprime borrowers. To what extent were these folks who had no business getting those mortgages to begin with, and so if you foreclose on them, they should never have had those houses to start with, and how much of that was predatory lending. You say that, see the same nature of those conversations in Europe, where some of the southern periphery say, hey, you you know, gave us all those funds, you loaned, not gave, you loaned all those things to us, you were taking a chance, and now you want your money back. You know, when the European Central Bank said, we will do what it takes to preserve the European Eurozone, and of course that really settled the markets, what the European Central Bank did was provide money to banks so that they could buy sovereign debts. It allowed German banks to get rid of Greek debt, and now all that bad debt is piled up in more of the southern banks. So at least we know where the bad debt is, but there's this relationship now between very weak governments and potentially very weak banks that hold a lot of questionable sovereign debt. So it is a real mess right now. There are two, two other uh, aspects to this which uh, I think play into it. One is the labor activity historically in Europe. Uh, and the second is the uh, much greater role that governments in Europe have played traditionally. So they're a bigger part of the economy and they have rigid uh, labor uh, traditions and laws and it's very difficult. Uh, when you add that to what Bill said, that when the sovereign debt was loaded out of the banks, that creates your three-part crisis. And a lot of that hasn't changed. That's right, that's right, good point. I'll take one more question, then I did, or two questions, and then I promised I would let you out of here. So if some of you feel like you have to leave at 11, please feel free. Pardon me? What are the big banks in Europe? What are the weak banks in Europe? Well, there's... <laughs> Paribus is one. Paribus in France. Uh, Agricole in France. Some of the Greek banks. The problem is obviously we don't have transparency on bank balance sheets. So I think the markets are looking very carefully at these European stress tests, which they did stress test before, but they were very weak and didn't really give us much information. I think after these stress tests and the re response to those stress tests, we'll have a bit of a better idea. You know, we could even talk about American banks. Despite our more rigorous stress tests and all that we've done for our banks, some people still argue Bank of America and Citigroup are still, relatively speaking, weaker than some of the other banks. So I'm going to stop there without pointing to any particular bank. And certainly don't use any remarks I make to start moving your funds around. <laughs> yes? Um, how much of the problem is this tax and voice? How much, I'm sorry. How much of a problem is 
tax avoidance issue that varies by country. You talked about in your solution different things, but you didn't mention this. Can the crisis be resolved without addressing this? No, tax avoidance is a very serious problem. And uh, Greece has come under a lot of criticism in particular, but it's not confined to Greece in terms of tax avoidance. You know, there have been cases now where, uh, you know, the Greek government said, we will put your tax bill on your electric bill, because at least we know <laughs> who's getting electricity. And then, of course, then the electric company said, no, we're not going to send bills out with taxes on them. So everyone's playing the same game. It's a real problem in Greece. It's a whole culture of not paying taxes. It's, it's a real problem because you need to be, I mean, Greece is basically insolvent. It cannot have the government services it does unless it is willing to pay the taxes for them. And it has, yeah. So Greece was probably one of my first rec uh, countries I would highlight as the needing to leave the Eurozone. And Merkel actually said during the, her election campaign that I think at one point maybe the mic was on and she didn't realize it, but she said that Greece should not be part of the Eurozone. Her public posture is we will maintain all of the Eurozone. I think the worry is if you let one go, you could have a domino effect. But um, Greece should never have been a member. It got a great ride for a few years. It started in 2001, so from 2001 to about 2007, it did great. Um, but I think the party's over. One last question. Yes. Is it right to, uh, uh, when you think about Germany, is it, is it right to say maybe they benefited the most from the Eurozone because it made their exports more viable to the other countries? Because uh, it was one currency that worked these for them. That yes. Affects risk. yes. So it's, maybe they should be paying a higher portion of the problem. That argument has also been used. You're absolutely right. Germany has a very large, we call it a current account surplus. It's a bit broader definition just than the trade surplus. But it has a very large current account surplus. And yet the Eurozone countries as a whole, or the European Union as a whole, is in balance. So what does that tell you? It tells you Germany is running large surpluses, exporting more than they import, but other European countries are running large deficits. So even though they share a single currency, the de facto or shadow exchange rates are out of alignment. And Germany is actually reaping the benefits of being very competitive. If they had individual exchange rates, Germany's currency would be appreciating, and that would reduce its trade surplus. Other countries could become more competitive. Now, if you can't change currency values, one thing to do is to have maybe more inflation in Germany. But of course, we know since the 1920s, that's a no-no. So that's not a way that you're going to be able to reduce German competitiveness, uh, relatively speaking, compared to the other uh, European countries. So yes, the Germans are pointing I mean, this is a bit of a, a um, j too easy a comment, but they're saying the, the bad behavior is elsewhere. But they have benefited as well. And their banks were also banks that lent a lot to the southern periphery at, um, from 2001 on. Is there any hope for a political union in the next 500 years? <laughs> <laughs> we, none of us have a crystal ball. I think there's still a very strong commitment to go together that Germany is very reluctant to be, it's a strong powerhouse economy, but it's very reluctant to be out there front and center without being embedded in Europe because of the history that goes with that. So we'll see. Thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful day.